All righty. Well, we'll get started. Simon, do you want to come and join us? Hey, Simon, welcome. Hey, Scott. Good to have you on board. All right. Thank so you. Um, just quickly, so we're going to be talking about Simon about product ops, the why and the how. A um, little bit about Terum. We're a tech product development and strategy firm across Eastern Australia, New Zealand, California. Um, love working with enterprise tech companies. We love building product. It's why we do these. We love kind of chatting to everyone in and around product. We love sharing what we're learning. Um, love talking with all of you around, around product as well. Uh, I am Scott. I'm the CEO and founder of, of Terum. I've been involved in pro over more, more than 61 now major product launches. I've helped uh, tech scale ups through to government enterprise. Like I, I've worked across across the spectrum as well as, as startup. And at the end of the day, like one, one of my other passions is making sausages, and uh, I love sailing. Like it's one of my one of my favorite kind of special places when I'm not shipping product and building tech businesses. Um, what we've got Simon here with us. So S Simon is the uh, director of product ops at Willow. I think one of the other things I've loved about following along with Simon is the podcast that he's got, which is over to the side there, which is all about product ops. Um, if, you, if you want to check it out, please do so uh, afterwards. Um, Simon's really involved in the community as well, mentor of Blackbird, instructor at General Assembly. And uh, Simon, you, you get involved with helping with um, Movember and some, some kind of great stuff there as well. Yes. And just, just before I hand over to you to get into the... The, the meat of it that everyone's kind of waiting for. I, I'd love to see a show of hands from everyone who's currently got product ops in their organization on the call. I think you can do the raise, the raised hand or or throw a like I do into the, the chat or something like that. I'm just keen to see who's who's got product ops. All right, so we've got one person. Uh, is there any more? Anyone else? No, got no, that's it. Oh, here we go. Not at all. Yeah. All right. So let's let's flip it. Who doesn't have, who doesn't have product ops? Cool. One person. All right. So there's eighty percent. Uh, none of the above or thereabouts. They're confused. Uh, so we'll, 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 help, we'll help with that. Oh, <laughs> uh, here we go. No. All right. So a bunch of people said I don't, and I had to Google it. Super interesting. So like. That's right. what I thought. Yeah. yeah what is yeah, product yeah. ops? Yeah. Who, who? All right. Here's a good one. Who doesn't know what product ops is? And there's no, there's no bad answers here. Yeah. Who doesn't know what product ops is and is keen to understand it? Keen to learn. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Right. Right. We got two. Two for that one. Well, on a scale of on the data scale, <laughs> twice the response. Um, we've got a former product ops is there. Yeah. Cool. Super interesting. All right. Well, this should be an interesting, interesting kind of kind of chat. Then, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm going to stop sharing, Simon, and thank awesome. you, everyone. By the way, well, while we're kind of swapping over, thank you, everyone. By the way, for jumping in and and getting involved. Please jump in throughout the chat. I'll try and bring in your questions as, as we go. But Simon, over to you. Awesome. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, Scott. Is that it? Looking yeah, good. Awesome. Good. Good. Thank you for having me, first of all. I know we've had lots of great chats in the past, so it's great to share that with the, the rest of the community. So thank you for having me here. Um, yeah. My name's Simon Hilton, as Scott said, uh, Director of Product Ops at Willow, and today I'll be talking about the why and how of setting up product ops. Now, maybe I'll go into a little bit of the story, because when I was first asked, hey, can you sort out our product ops, I was like, hey, you made that word up. That doesn't exist. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to Google it as well. And I think I just providing that space it is a relatively new function for a lot of uh, organizations um, but I think there is a fast growing community and a lot of consensus growing around why it's needed how it helps and all those kinds of things and that's what I'm trying to really illuminate today everything that I've learned through the conversations I've had I think my first season of product ops people's just really wrapped up then and really has uh, set the stage for what's what's coming so really excited to share this all with you today so um, Really, product managers today have a lot on their hands. They uh, have to do a lot of things. I mean, the, the role has progressed a lot since the, you know, the decades that it's been around, but they have to be involved in user research, product analytics, development, strategy, stakeholder engagement. And these are just a few of the you know, mountain of tasks and, and, and capabilities and crafts that a product manager needs to be across. 
um, each one of these is a craft in its own right. You can have a whole career around user research. You can have a whole career around uh, data and analytics. So asking a product manager to be an expert in each of these domains and to do everything that needs to be done to make a product successful, is, is it's a tall order. And, and really what it kind of ends up with is this idea that you need to have this full stack product manager, this person who's uh, just as good every day at talking to customers, uh, diving into the data, uh, working with stakeholders, guiding leadership, working with the development team. But obviously that stretches the product manager quite thin. I don't, I don't know anyone that fit. I know a lot of great people in each of the areas, but I don't know anyone that would like, and they'd say it themselves, right? They're yes. not great at all of them. Absolutely. And, and even then, like, I mean, if you read a lot of the great product books out there, it talks about how... Um, you know, you do have to be good at all these things, but it can actually create a lot of anxiety in product manager as well. It's like, I'm supposed to be all these things, but I'm just not. Um, um, but at the same time, as you're pointing out, um, it's, it, you may be, you know, maybe you're good in a certain area, but at the end of the day, we need to make, it, there's a lot to do. Um, and so let me just move to the next slide. So it's really important that, you know, we understand that, okay, so how are we going to, how's this person going to do it? How are they actually going to excel and be set up for success in being able to do all of these things? Um, I think a few people have realized that it's not possible to do everything, especially when, you know, you do look, again, looking at these books, um, people will say that you spend 80% of your time with the customer. Okay, so how am I going to jam that 20% back into all the things that need to be done in the business? Uh, understanding the product, working with development teams, et cetera. It just seems like there's a little bit too much going on. So some ways that people have tried to solve this problem is to really compartmentalize the product manager. Um, now, this is a very crude way of understanding the product development process, but you can understand you have discovery where you're finding out the problem, strategy where you're, what, are we, you know, what direction we're going to take, road mapping with aligning with stakeholders and development. Um, some people have chosen to, to fix this problem by saying, okay, product manager, you just worry about the roadmap and development we'll take care of all this up here and you don't have to worry about that. Or even in the case of, well, you know, you're, you're spending so much time in discovery and strategy that, you know, the your team can't deliver because they have no real great connection to, to, to the end to end. Um, so what that really, the problem that we have there is that you, you lose the why. When there's so many handoffs and you start splitting up the role, um, there's, there's this losing of why we're doing this, why is it important, how is it valuable to the customer, and I think, I think people do realize this. I mean, sometimes it comes, ac comes across in the PMPO split that sometimes happens in some organizations. But what we really want and what the, the, the optimal scenario that we're all shooting for is that you can have a product manager who can own that end-to-end -end understanding of a feature, who can shepherd it from discovery into strategy through the roadmap and through development without having to uh, hand off, as we're saying, to, to, to other people in the organization. But we still have the same problem of, uh, how do you get the time to do that? How are you going to get the time to spend, to go all the way through? And this is where the idea of that thin slice product manager really comes into it. You can't do everything, but you've got to kind of just limit your slice, but make it all the way through. And, but then we've got to ask about, you know, well, how do we actually solve this? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I went, went one too many, sorry. But you've got to ask, well, what's the greatest contribution that a product manager has to the, uh, the product development process. Um, my answer to that and what I advocate is the greatest uh, contribution a product manager has is in their decision-making power. They're the ones who sit at the center of usability, uh, desirability, viability, all those kinds of things um, in order to have a better understanding of everything across the organization. They understand the business context. They've got to understand the customer need. They've got to understand the engineering capability. But at the end of the day, they've got to balance all that back into um, great decisions, which result in excellent products. But where are they going to get the time to do that? That's one of the biggest problems. Thinking takes uh, more than just a few minutes a day. Um, it takes, uh, and the other important thing is that decision-making is, uh, is only as good as the information that's provided. Garbage in, garbage out. So in order for them to make great decisions, they need to have great data. And in order to create great data, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in user research, breaking down, synthesizing that information into uh, knowledge and wisdom, getting into data, developing funnels, uh, understanding where the drop-off points are, where are the trade-offs. All of these things require time. And again, we're caught in that same bind. 
And usually how this happens in a lot of organizations is they just stop. people don't have the time to do these things. So they won't be consulting uh, uh, qualitative data. They won't be consulting product analytics. They'll just be shooting from the hip and, uh, and making the best decision they can at the time. But is this really how an organization wins? Is this how a product management function excels? And this is where a lot of the thinking around product ops has really come from. It's like, how do we enable product managers? How do we set them up for success? How do we get the most repeatable stuff off their plate so they can focus more on making great decisions and working with the business and, and the wider stakeholder group, whether it's customers or, or sales teams or customer success or whatever it is, in making sure those decisions are not only made, but they're supported and, and launched effectively. And that's where the idea of product ops really comes from. It's in creating those enabling services. It's in supporting product managers because we think, we believe that when you do that, you create an excellent product organization, which is less focused on the tactics, more focused on the strategy, and ultimately more focused on aligning to the strategy that your business is trying to execute and market. Um, and the best way that I've seen this summed up is by this one line from Melissa Perry, who basically said, product ops is about helping teams inform deploy and monitor their product strategy. So it can actually be quite a, it can actually be quite misleading when you see the ops title. The whole focus of the product ops role is really about executing strategy, but making it in such a repeatable, understandable, uh, uh, repeatable, what am I looking for here? Just monitorable way of, of, of executing that you can focus more on focusing on the strategy because you know the execution is taken care of. You have the people in the right spots, the right processes are in place, the right tools are there to, to help them all move forward. So essentially it's about informing, how do we find the data that will inform our strategy? What was our customer, what was our churn last year, uh, last month? Um, how, many, how many users did we onboard? The things that make reality out of where we are right now, deploying it, where is the strategy? How do people access it and know what's important? How do they fit into the overall uh, plan that the business is, is moving towards? And then monitoring it. Well, how far along are we? Um, have, did the ship feature ship this quarter or next quarter? And, and, and those, those changes that happen within the product in an agile environment are effectively communicated and we're all aligned on that. So I think this is a really, really great summary of how product ops really supports the organization because it really allows you to have good strategy and focus on that good strategy, execute it well, and most importantly, build some great autonomy in teams. When teams have a excellent strategy to work towards um, and they have a great operational success structure around them, there's more autonomy they can take in understanding the customer context. Because remembering they're usually the teams that are close to the customer and making great decisions which move towards the ultimate objective. And the way that I describe this at, at Willow, this is exactly actually my uh, manifesto <laughs> that I put out to the whole product organization within Willow and then the, the wider organization, is there's three pillars by which we, um, by which my product ops function within Willow um, really pursues, this is our strategy. Um, and it's funny because I, I, I've actually had a very similar conversations with, I ran a, uh, a kind of a, panel discussion with a whole bunch of product manage, uh, product ops managers. And we all largely had the same definition, which was great to see. Like this is quite a well thought out uh, structure. But then I was also on a call yesterday with Melissa Perry and I was talking to her through this and she said, no, that's exactly what I've been uh, um, communicating out to the, the world and the business as, as well. Um, so the first one is really uniting people with processes and tools. So the focus is on people here, but at the end of the day, uh, they operate together and create alignment through the ways that they work together and the information repositories that they use. And this is becoming, I believe, even more uh, relevant during distributed with distributed models and, in, and during COVID. The tools sometimes took a back seat in the past because we we're all in the same spot and we could talk to each other. But when you're in a distributed model, having a space for product management, having a space for research and, and design is actually quite important because it aligns people into a single source of truth. But true, I mean, there's a whole lot, bunch of stuff that goes along with that as well. There's uh, the business cases that need to be written, the tools that need to be set up, the configuration that needs to happen, the, uh, the quality checks to make sure that 
things aren't just being left in a constant state of decay uh, or, or entropy once you know people start updating items and, 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 and keeping that communication flowing between teams. So being able to unite those people, and this is important, it's all about the people, not about the processes and tools, but they still contribute to each other, is a key part of that function because it, again, helps us align as a business to make sure we're all going in one direction to, uh, uh, to, to deploy and uh, complete the strategy. And that's where the kind of the second pillar of cross, creating cross-organization alignment is really important. Um, there's a whole bunch of activities that need to be done in most organizations about um, how we, uh, again, I love coming back to that line, in, uh, inform, deploy, and monitor the strategy. So typically, we can run the product ops function. It can help facilitate quarterly objectives planning, breaking down of those, uh, uh, informing the strategy based upon, okay, so what important context needs to happen out of the, uh, the product team? Um, what objectives are they planning in the next quarter? Communicating that out to the broader stakeholders and, and running any sort of uh, communication around around that, but also making sure that any sort of changes to that plan are clearly understood as well. If you decided to deliver a major feature in this quarter, so for some reason technology has delayed that, you need to make sure that all your sales teams, customer success, customers are all aligned around those changes, so there's no missed expectations as well. There's also work in aligning teams across geographic regions, of delivery, and things like that. And then finally, I think the most important one is um, making the right data easily available. Again, this is about empowerment. It's about making sure that product teams have what they need to do what they need to do, to move at the speed they need to move at. And one of the most important ways they can do that is having the right data to make micro decisions uh, in their context. So this means having access to the right product analytics, um, even having product analytics I've seen in a lot of organizations, maybe they didn't even have that set up. but. Um, then also having access to the right uh, user research, which can help them decide: okay, do we do we go do we do this feature or that feature, or do we focus on this target persona or this target persona? Um, and then even coming back to the whole strategy thing, how many organisations can say where their strategy is? Does it live on a, a PowerPoint in someone's desktop, or is it actually well communicated and available for people to make those decisions day to day within their product organisation in their cross-functional team? So, I mean, I, I believe this pretty much encompasses a lot of product ops. I mean, it's going to grow, it's going to change. It's, it's an evolving conversation as we, as we um, continue into it and all the conversations that we're having. But if you can unite the people, processes and tools, so they're all, uh, the information you need is always available somewhere through, a, uh, through an asynchronous kind of work environment. Um, if you can create cross-organization alignment to say, we're all moving in this direction, this is, and this is the steps we're going to take in the immediate future and how you're going to contribute to that. And then when you hit a roadblock or, you know, now that we have the, the boundaries, you're going to make the decisions and we trust you to make those decisions with autonomy because you have the right data available. You're making it from a place of not a gut, but you're making it from a data-led decision uh, culture. That's a hugely empowering environment for any product organization. It's a hugely empowering uh, environment to drive product behaviors, which are focused on customer data, um, outcomes and strategy, which I believe a lot of product managers are really craving for. Um, they want to be given these opportunities, but uh, a lot of the time they don't have the, and I can, I, can, I can actually understand why in some spaces, well, I can't trust you to make that decision because you don't have the data. Whether that's their decision on, whether that's their fault or not is not the case, but we need to empower these product managers with the right, uh, services in order to have them be accountable for the success of the product. So where is product ops really uh, showing up? Typically it's in scaling tech companies. Um, and you'll find, I mean, if you did a search of product ops in on LinkedIn or Glassdoor or whatever it is, a few places that would show up would be places like Uber, GitLab, Zendesk, Stripe, all of these obviously are really uh, scaling. Um, I, I guess these are the biggest, by the way. I'm, I'm sure you will find it in a lot of places, but I think this is just a, uh, a it's just evidence that if you value your product and you're anticipating lots of scale that's going to happen and you want to empower teams so you don't have to constantly be realigning them and reintegrating them back into your strategy, product ops is something that can really help you. Because 
what I just talked about there is really, really important. As your organization grows and as it faces more and more challenges in that scaling journey, are you going to be there to make every decision from a top down? Probably not. And in a lot of cases, that's just going to slow you down. So if you're going to develop a team and an organization, which can really have that learning culture, um, give people autonomy, as long as they understand the alignment that they've got to have with the business, with the product, with the market, whatever it is, then that's the secret sauce to really being creating really empowered teams, which ultimately, I mean, that's one of the uh, key things a lot of people are looking for in their, in their search for a role. Is that, um, what is it? Autonomy, mastery and purpose from Dan Pink's drive. You know, that autonomy of understanding um, what I can do and I can really bring my best self to work and use my best decision-making here. Um, so it is actually a bit of a shift also. If you're gonna take product up seriously, you have gotta make sure that you're not moving into a command and control structure, but you're actually really focused on saying, we have high standards. We want you to own a lot of this, but we're gonna support you and make sure that you have the services and the tools and the processes to make you help you move fast. Okay. Any questions yet, Scott, that we should stop for? Oh, no, no, keep going, keep going. Mm, love to. Uh, well, you, well, actually one, like one, it's more of a, a comment, which, which is, uh, you know, what I found really interesting is the similarities between DevOps, uh, strategy ops, sales ops. The list kind of goes on, but the, the, that central theme of a, it's really about enabling like for DevOps, you're enabling the developers to get code to production as fast as possible, as scalable as possible, so they can focus on logic or like the business value, whatever you want to call it. And then it's similar with this, like with product ops, it's all about enabling product managers to make decisions faster. And I was thinking about, um, you know, metrics of success for a product function are kind of around like, were we able to make decisions faster or, you know, that time to decision, was it compressed instead of taking four weeks to decide whether we're going to build a new feature? Did it maybe take, which is kind of hard because <laughs> yeah, yep. you never know like whether that's a good metric, but that's kind of where my, my mind was going. And then it's, it's an enabler. Can't, it, it's really such an enabling function, but it's, it's a lot more than that as well was it like, that's all that's going through my mind well, no I, th I think you even the words you're saying just want to underline them completely because i think you're really hitting it on the head there and it does borrow a lot from all of those functions and all those kind of disciplines but there's some key themes that they all have in common and that's enablement as you're talking about we want you to be able to do more with less we want to focus your attention not off the uh, you know, regression tests of clicking buttons and things like that. We want you to actually focus on solving complex problems as an engineer, but that doesn't take away from any of the accountability. DevOps is actually more about accountability. Mm. You're still accountable for your code in production, but there's so much of the uh, the day-to-day -day kind of redoing stuff that's going on that's taken care of that you can uh, focus on the higher order problems that we want you to solve. And and I think you're, you're right. It is, it is very much the same discipline inside product ops. Um, let's take the mundane wrote things off the product manager's uh, plate and raise the bar as far as their, uh, their skill, their accountability, um, while all the time making sure that they are, um, are, are solving the really hard questions. And sometimes you know, product managers don't have the time to solve those questions. To really get into like, strategy to, to 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 sit down and talk with the customer about the biggest problems. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, that's well, that's and this, this time thing of uh, another measure that I was thinking about of success was like, you know, if you if you could do a poll of your uh, of your your product managers at one point when you start and when you finish and you say, how much time do you spend thinking is almost the key, <laughs> thinking and making decisions and like versus how much time do you spend in email or meetings or in Slack or something like that. And I think product ops is like pulling them away from meetings and chasing data down and all that, like, or stakeholder engagement, all that, and bringing it back to sitting and thinking, hope, hopefully about like, what, what investments am I going to make in a product? What, what features do I need to deprecate because it's a problem or what's going on with my customers as their lives changed? I think that's a, it's a, 
Yeah, that's that, that's what's going through my mind. I'll let, I'll let you keep going with them. Um... I'll, I'll continue on in a second, but one, something you said there were really hit it because yeah. I was talking with the head of product recently who said they measure their the quality of their team by the uh, the initiatives they've come up with, the alternatives they've considered, and how they've and that doesn't mean they're going to be right every time, but they need to know that they've done the thinking to say this is the best option, the best bang for buck we can do right now. I may be right, I may be wrong, but they want to know that that decision is sound so they can. Um, they can uh, oh, interesting have the best differential, the margin that they, the margin that their decisions added. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's because it's, it's a prob probabilistic kind of decision. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. sometimes you'll get it wrong, but if as long as you're making using good decision making hygiene of yeah you know, habits, uh, yeah. that's what you want people focusing on. Yeah, yeah. But if but if you're stuck in in all the rote work, where are you going to get the time to do that? So. And, and so, sorry to cut into the slide here a bit, but like, you know, you've got multiple teams, multiple products, distributed model. In, in your view, when do you add this in? Is it like after two product managers? Is it after five? Is it after 20? What, what's the number here? I, I, I'd be hesitate to give you a number because I think it's quite, quite contextual, but I'll still give you one anyway. <laughs> I think I think That's the right get, answer, Simon. That's the I, right answer to any. any. I, I, I'm going into the three to five range. Like it yeah. depends on your organization, but three to five range. Yeah. Um, but it also does depend on the dimension. So if you've got five teams across one product, that's going to be less of a problem than five teams across two or three products. Yeah, yeah. Each one of these is a multiplying factor in complexity for your organization. Um, multiple teams all working on different teams working on different products. And especially when they're not in the office anymore and they can't talk to each other, it's very, very easy for everyone to run off in their own direction. It's very, very easy for people to not be aligned. And I think this distributed model part is super salient at this point of time because, you know, as we see with all of a lot of the tech companies, their distributed is actually a the future for them. That they've they've made a big decision around that. So how do you keep people aligned when they don't have hallway conversations? They don't have they may not be talking to 99% of the company. They'll only be talking to their, their, their local team. The systems and processes and tooling that you use to keep those people aligned starts to become a lot more important. Um, and then check into the mix different time zones. You know, the, all of these things, I think, that's why I think it's, it's slightly a local thing because that, that multiplying factor of teams, products, time zones, if all of those are at a five out of five, you're going to have problems. But if you know you've got to you've got to weight those specifically. But um, hopefully I didn't dodge your answer too much there, Scott. <laughs> no, but, it, but like I I I see it at about that level as well, right? Like you've got three people, even even at two, you you need um the I think it was like the product analyst role, someone who's like like ideally you want that like someone who's getting the information, doing the research, like doing the interviews, all that kind of stuff bringing that back, you know, hashing it out with, with a senior product manager or something like it's such a valuable, valuable thing to have to do that analysis. So I can totally see. And let's, that, yeah. Let's take it. Let's take a really great example of that. Just a really direct example. A product manager asking where do people, where are the top three places people drop off in the customer journey? Yeah. That is a, yeah. maybe a five hour job for someone to actually go and do, but on the product manager only just needs the three places. They don't need to, do all the rest of it. So you've got to really ask yourself, where do you want your product manager spending their time? That's where really it all comes down to. And unless they're thinking about uh, the strategy and the decisions that need to be made, and, and this is the most important thing, bringing people in that vision, right? Being out there actually making sure that the teams are aligned around that feature, the stakeholders and customer success managers understand why it's valuable. I mean, the why, that's what I was coming back to in my previous slide, making sure the why is very clear and present through the entire process. Um, that's where you're probably going to get the most value out of the product managers that you're hiring. So, I mean, there's a question here from, from Bill. Thanks for the question, Bill. It is, um, it's like, what about for early stage new product startup? Like, is it three customers or, or, or 10 customers? I, do, yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? I, I don't think it's, I think it's an evolution of the role. Earlier on in that time, your product manager will be doing all the product ops stuff. If you have one product manager in an early stage company, they will be the one setting up your tools. They will be the one doing a lot of product analytics. So you're kind of coming to the point of when, when are the product managers better off not doing that stuff and turning that into an actual role? Um, I do think it's coming into that three to five 
kind of product managers who are trying to keep three, maybe two or three teams aligned. There's going to be enough work there at that point to say, hey, product managers, stop doing the product ops function yourself. L let me make a point here. Product ops as a function has been around for a long time, but actually specializing and operationalizing it, just like DevOps has been around for a long time in the engineer. But eventually someone said, I don't want them doing that. I want them focused on the really hard stuff. That's where DevOps came out of the engineering role and into its own kind of space. Um, in the same way, product ops has product managers have been setting up JIRA and you know, running meetings and all this kind of stuff, doing quarterly objectives. But there was a point where we realized, wait a minute, this is better off A, because people can focus their time, but also B, when we bring on new product managers into the organization, they can just hit the ground running that we all have a standard way of doing things. They understand this is how we, we, we develop product at company X and they can get to work rather than having to walk around to five or six different product managers and say, well, how do you do it? 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 And ending up with five different ways that we do a roadmap. So I think that's, those are the two points that really can help you understand when product ops is, is going to be valuable. Bill says, thanks for a big thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Okay, so what we're trying to do here is create, um, I think this, you, you pointed out the, the point earlier, and I think this is a really, really important point. We're trying to create services. We're not trying to create gates. And what I mean here is that we're trying to create things which are inherently valuable and people will call or customers, uh, sorry, product managers will call in, help, in order to help them get a result. They don't want to know how the thing happens behind it. They don't really need to. They don't need to be an expert in product analytics. They don't need to be an expert in uh, in uh, customer research, but they still need to understand it conceptually and understand how it uh, relates to the decision that they're about to make about which product to build, what market to attend to. So, go so ahead. You, can you like kind of elaborate on a service, right? So you said like product analytics and you gave that example before of, you know, where are the biggest drop offs, drop offs in yeah. my funnel? And then you, you I think um, you gave an example to, to me before we were chatting around like, well, another one would just be we're launching a new feature please go and like manage the launch of that new feature. It might be a service. And and because that means like you might have to do a blog post. You might have to record a video that shows customers how it works. You may even have to do a roadshow yep. with some of your key customers and go and do a bit of FaceTime to say, hey, by the way, we've just done a big upgrade. You know, he, here's what something looks like. Marketing's got to do things. Legal might need to be involved. I don't know. Like that, That's another service as well. So, and it's not just like, a technology it could be a technology with with um like you and your product ops team going and doing some work as well another like sorry another service you've mentioned is um the quarterly reviews like run you know get my quarterly review ready for me or for a leader it might be check in on how everyone's tracking against their quarterly goals is that what like absolutely I kind of so know like it all of those services <laughs> all of those services need to be repeatable right we're not yeah. trying to solve there's no point trying to crack a different nut each time. You want to be able to go, okay, this is how we do a product launch because we want it to have a level of quality and we want to have a level of repeatability. So, and, and also this is something which when we know how to do it, you're, you're not applying, you don't want to put your most creative. And you don't want to think, it. and you don't want to be thinking about it like a product launch. Correct. It's not really a differentiated, uh, boy, if we do it differently this time, we might maybe depend maybe, maybe for a yeah. major feature but for most yeah. features there's just going to be basic yeah. things need yeah. to be done let's update the documentation let's put a blog post out there let's add analytics to it like whatever it is but there's going to be regular things that need to be done that are repeatable and you obviously actually in some ways you don't want to change it because you want to have a level of quality and alignment across the business that every feature we put out these things have happened Check, 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 check. And so that actually takes a lot of load off again, off the product manager or anyone involved to focus more on the complex, uh, higher stakes, more brain power decision-making needs to happen, um, which takes time and depth to really get the right outcome. Um, coming back to the services and not gates kind of concept I have here on the screen, it's really important to uh, not think of this in a way like a traditional project model. These aren't gates you're putting in place to say, well, before you get to uh, development, you need to have this, 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 and this, and you can't go past the gate unless you have that. Um, when you're about to launch a feature, you need to do this, 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 and this, fill out form 22X <laughs> in order to get past this stage and then uh, get through that gate. We're not trying to create gates here, we're trying to create services. And the best way I've found to think about this is when I was actually going through, you know, trying to 
embed product ops down in my mind is uh, thinking about your product ops like an API product. Um, people often refer to product ops as doing the product method on the product function. So when you actually think about it like that, um, the best the closest product one can think of is a great API service. Now, if I'm an engineer and I'm trying to create a fashion app, for example, um, but I need to know the weather in order for that fashion app to say what to wear today. Do I need to go out and start to learn how to build weather stations and you know understand maximum temperatures and stuff? No, I can actually outsource that part and focus on my core skill of creating the best fashion app in the world. In the same way, if you can take that mindset, what are the services that are not your core skill are important, but just all you need is a result. I, I submit my, my, my method and I get a result. That's it. That's all I need so I can focus on my core product. Um, and I think this is a really, really great way of thinking about um, uh, product ops because it starts taking, turning things more from a process kind of form filling exercise into why do we need this? Um, how is it going to be valuable? How is it going to save time? And there's actually a really great book uh, when I was doing my research on this, the API, uh, what is it? The, the product guide to APIs or something from Google. I think you've APIs read APIs product. I know the book. It's like, yeah. I feel like it's the most underrated white paper in the history of the, in, of, of the product internet. But anyway. That's I, I, I completely agree. I, I got this and I was like, wait a minute, there's got to be something out there about this. So I read this paper and I could literally probably just replace the word API with product ops and it all made sense to me. Um, and these are actually three questions are actually, I, I took from that, that, that paper, which was when you start thinking about these services which you're building, you want to actually treat it like a product. So yes, you do want to go out and do user research. What is, where, where are your pains? Where are your gains? What, what, what's, what's sucking up all your time? What does your day look like? How can we improve that overall flow? So you're not doing the boring, you know, uh, low value stuff. And we're focusing your attention in feeling great, doing a great job, doing the high value work. Um, so you can ask questions like, as I said from the paper, how often is this service being called? How often are people actually um, calling on your product analytics service because they think it's easier than doing it themselves? Um, what, when they're asking that, are they asking for uh, raw data? Are they asking you to create dashboards? Like where is the best value for you to, to create those services? And finally, are people actually using it? Are they changing their behavior? Um, so, and then uh, this is another important point. As your product ops function grows, the product ops team you're going to need when you're an early stage startup, someone mentioned that in the chat versus people I talked to saying the product ops at an early startup is about turning that pirate into a kind of a Navy team where it's, it's, it's repeatable. Whereas at an enterprise, it's just about creating that overall really strong alignment. Um, you need to understand when to deprecate some methods. You say, well, this worked for us now. This service isn't being called so more. It's not relevant. We're going to stop doing that and focus our attention on building this service, which is, uh, is going to get us to the next stage of where we want to go. So when you think about operating your team, like a server to make a progress. I mean, this is a pretty uh, stock standard uh, uh, concept that we use in all software development. And it's no different here. Um, in order to improve the outcomes and, the, and the, the, the capability of your product team. And, the, and the, the distinction's really important. Like you're thinking about the product managers and the product leaders and the rest of the organization as like your customer, yes. not, not which I like if you're thinking in the, I guess, traditional top-down approach to the world or the project, like, top-down project management. I actually think there's a good place for project management, but mm -hmm. that traditional like top-down kind of style, the command and control, like there's an office that's dictating everything. Like that's not thinking of things as your customer. It's thinking of like, what gates are we going to put in so no one destroys anything? And also, <laughs> exactly. and also like they will do what we tell them and fill out the forms that they need to get. Like it's not it's, it's like reverse, right? Yeah, the way I think about that is... these people, not how do they serve me? Well, I think those structures are great, but they're for managing risk. Yeah. But ma managing risk doesn't produce great products. Managing, but producing great products is by enabling people to solve customer problems. And I think I agree with you. Like 
that there are times and spaces for using a project management approach, especially maybe in a high risk environment or a highly regulated environment. But most cases we're overdoing it in that space and managing risk and not enabling the product teams to, to uh, perform product behaviors, which ultimately result in, in customer focused value. Mm. Awesome. Um, and what you kind of end up with there is a coming back to that hamburger rather than just having them to do everything you have that you come to a model where you have the product manager in the center doing the decisions executing the product management code in the middle here but they're enabled they're enabled with understanding well at any time you can call these services you need some user research great come over here it's all packaged up for you or just tell us what you need and we'll get back to you um same with product analytics or, hey, here's the strategy. It's on one page. Um, it's, enable, it's, a, it's available for you to make uh, any decisions. And, you know, that strategy will be updated every quarter as we, as a product ops team leads the uh, product leadership through a, a you know, a quarterly planning uh, exercise. Um, so that creates a much more autonomous, enabled and outcome focused um, environment which is what we want product managers to be doing. We want them to be exhibiting these behaviors. We want them to be focused on value, not, I mean, the, what's, the, what's the saying? Uh, outcomes over output. We don't want them doing the work. We want them focused on, well, how, what are the outcomes that we're pursuing and how do I expediently get to that outcome? And this is a way to help them make those decisions, not be forced into a certain way of working. You know, and the, uh, there's this, stat that always comes to mind for me when thinking about time and where where product folks spend their time which is you know a survey of i think it was a couple of hundred or a, a thousand or two product managers and leaders said most of them spend their time uh in emails meetings and slack and not on strategy coming up with ideas and with the team or talking to cut or like time with customers at all so it's it's like anything that helps them spend more time on that strategic thinking workshops with the team over like your kind of I guess run-of-the-mill meetings is like and and communication is a really like handy thing to have completely agree with you Scott <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said it very well um uh but and it only, this isn't just for product managers. I think this is going to be a really important point. Like product managers, to be clear, are the, probably the, 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 the first customer that I think about when I, uh, when I, when I, when I'm thinking about product ops, because they're the, they're the target group, which if I satisfy them and they're able to focus on having an autonomous environment where they can make the right decisions that are data led, as I said before, and execute them well with their development team, that I believe will ultimately, um, uh, result in better value, especially in, if in a fastly iterating environment. Um, but it's also product leaders, which really, I've, when I talk to product leaders on my podcast, like your CPOs and VPs of product, they really value this as well for, because in a scaling product, tech product startup or whatever it is, um, as I said before, there's so much work in working with your board, um, understanding market opportunities, dealing with strategic partners, um, just there's so much at a executive level to keep moving forward and to paving the way that a lot of the time they feel guilty that I don't get the time to spend with the operational side of the, the organization. And sometimes product managers aren't set up for success because there's so much that needs, needs to be done at a strategic level. So they really value the opportunity to say, well, I, when I can walk into a room with a product team, just talk about you know, strategy, uh, uh, customers and all the things that really matter and not have to worry about all the problems that they're having, that uh, firstly, that enables me to get the information I need to steer the ship, but also I, it helps me kind of traverse around the organization a lot easier. Um, and this isn't absolving the, the leadership of, of caring about these things, but when they know that there's, they have a uh, dedicated um, focus on developing a united system with, for, uh, of processes and tools, which ultimately serve the people, they can let that run. They can say, look, execution's going well, um, the team have what they need. I've hired smart people and I'm going to let them give them the guardrails and let them run straight at the problem. Then that's, that's the most important thing to do there. And I can focus more on paving the way at the top level um, for the market, for the, from the board, from strategic partners and all the other things that 
really have very high leverage. And it is important for them to focus on that. Let's be very clear. Those things are extremely high leverage for any, um, for any company, even coming down to setting company culture and things like that. So it, 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 again, like getting your product managers to focus on higher order problems, you also want your product leaders to focus on those higher order problems as well because of the massive effect it has on, on the direction and the velocity of the business. So typically your product manager, your product ops manager will uh, report into a VP of product or a CPO um, because it's super important that your strategic and operational elements are aligned, that they're in lockstep. So when a strategy is defined and even informed, as I said before, by the operational context, that it is being executed and they have keen visibility on, okay, we deployed this strategy. How's the quarter going? How can I get that information really quickly and easily so I can make any trimming decisions that need to be made, correct, give any guidance back to the team, and I can get back to the more strategic uh, elements of the business. So it's not just product managers benefit, product leaders. And I, I guess another point I want to make is the adjacent parties that, that benefit. So a significant part of my role is not just working with a product team, but it's working with uh, sales teams and customer success teams and delivery teams and understanding how they are influenced by the product team. Because essentially we are a product business at the end of the day, they rely on us. So I need to think about their needs, but also how we can uh, be influenced by the information that they have. What signals can we get back from those parts of the organization, which will ultimately help the product managers make good decisions. Now, I want to go into a little bit what the, PM, what the product ops function is not, because I think this has come up quite a bit in, in recent literature. Um, and a big nod to Office Space here, because we don't want to go down that direction. <laughs> but it's, it's not a reinvented uh, pro, pro, project management office. Like Scott said, it's not, um, project management has its time and place, but it's not, they are separate, different things. One's about managing risk. One's about progressing scope. The other is about enabling services, empowering teams, and ultimately helping them move faster. Um, so it can be quite, some people can think, okay, I'll just take my project managers, rebrand them as product ops, and suddenly everything's working. Well, that's not the case. Um, you certainly really want to be focusing on anyone in that role on measuring them and, and giving them uh, outcomes like a product manager. What problems are you solving? What solutions are you coming up with? What alternatives have you, have you discussed? What's going to be the best thing for the customer or the, product, the team at this time? How are we measuring success? All of those things are really important. Quality and outcome do matter. I mean, not on time, on budget. Those things are very different uh, buckets there. It's also not the PMPO split, as I talked about before. Just taking a delivery team and saying, oh, this is your product operations manager. They will do all your story writing and keep everyone happy while the product manager goes and does this. That's also not what it is as well. Again, you're developing how people work um, so they can do the work better. So the systems, the tools, the frameworks that actually enable the people, not the, not the writing stories and, and running standups and, and all those kinds of things. And it's also not people delegation. It's not an opportunity for a product leader to say, well, I don't need to talk to the product team anymore. Product ops has that covered. Um, they still have a, a, a responsibility to the team to lead them be the actual product leader, um, talk about strategy, set standards of, um, of competency and skill within the team. Product ops will do that as well, just to be clear. They, will, they can provide a coaching function to the business. They can operationally make sure that um, we're adhering to quality standards, but that's in conjunction and in partnership with product leadership. Um, so if you're finding, if you're looking for your a product ops person within your organization. We talked about this before. Um, just to be clear, it is a very, uh, it's a growing uh, role. You'll, I, I talk with people in Europe and America, which seems to be more prevalent there. Um, I've also been asked, hey, can you help me run a, a product ops job description? And it is, uh, it, it, there, are, there are great examples out there. I think GitLab has a really great one on their handbook. But when you're looking for that product ops person, I think it's really important to point out that you're not looking for a junior. This person does need to be uh, somewhat of a product veteran because they know what great and good looks like um, from a discovery, strategy, development, uh, and road mapping point of view and how those things more importantly can fit together. Um, they need to have enough of a breadth to understand, well, this is what good research means and this is how it can influence and make great strategy and start connecting those dots all the way through the organization. 
So they should have a history of being able to improve team output with systems. So knowing what great looks like, but how do you actually turn that to a system that's, that everyone else can use? They need to be quite charismatic in being able to empower relationships and create alliances, as I said before. Um, you, you, you have to sell your system to the product managers. It can't just be an enforcement factor. You've got to be showing that you have empathy for them, uh, you're outcome focused, and this will actually help at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and that's not just with the product managers, that's with the adjacent organizations as well. Being able to build those bridges with, um, with your sales team. I think I remember having this conversation with a consultant talking about the biggest friction in most organizations between the products and sales teams. Bringing those two teams together is always going to make everyone's lives easier, but that's if you're actually being empathetic and, and giving them what they need. But for, and also that person's got to be competent at drawing wisdom from data. At the end of the day, it's about empowering those teams to make good decisions, but good decisions only come from good data. So what systems, what uh, uh, dashboards, what you know, whatever needs to be set up in order for them to make those decisions needs to be something which the product manager, product ops manager can uh, deliver upon as well. Hey, Simon, just within the product ops team though, like the, so you got a senior person, but you, you also have analysts mm -hmm. as well, right? Yep. Like there's, there's a few other roles in the team. Would you mind like, Talking a bit about that together, there's a question from uh, Sentinel. I hope I got got that right. Sentinel uh, is uh, around this, like, what are the roles? And I guess maybe you could talk through, like, what does a product ops team look like in a big organization where you specialized a bit? Great, great question. Um, so in the same way that one could think about when you're an early product manager in a startup, you're doing everything. You're doing user research. You're doing team coaching and delivery. You're doing, um, you know, everything but eventually as the organization grows those functions are split out into individual competencies and, and roles in the, and the product ops is the same way your first product ops person might be doing a whole bunch of these things but the roles you'll typically want to hire after that is one the product ops manager um, let's say if you have a director or something in product ops product ops manager which will be focused more on the um the cross-organizational alignment side of things. They're running the workshops, making sure quarterly planning is, is being happening. It's being informed by the right decision, right data. Um, we're monitoring against that, 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 that strategy and product leaders are kept informed. But then you'll also want a product strategist, sorry, a product analyst, as you're pointing out, the person completely responsible for all the data in the team. And what, what excites me about this role is that someone who can not only deliver upon product data, but also start combining data sets. So if you take, revenue data with usage data and start saying, okay, well, who are our most active users and are they our most profitable? Are they the people who can deliver the most growth um, because of the total addressable market? When you start outputting, outfitting, sorry, product leaders with that kind of data, strategy, strategy takes a whole different turn because you're actually understanding, well, what are the opportunities in front of us? What are the trade-offs and how do we actually, uh, which ones have we chosen and how are we going to deploy that? When you can give that kind of clarity to a team, they are hugely aligned and ready to run in that direction because the, the why is clear and present through the whole organization. Another way that you can actually, uh, some other roles, another role which typically can show up is the program managers. Now they can show up in a lot of organizations, but when you have cross team or cross product spanning initiatives, typically it's hard for pro to give a product manager that, that, um, that responsibility because they've got so much focus on solving their problem that how are they going to solve everyone else's problems as well. So in my team, we have a few program managers, which are from the product side of it, responsible for product initiatives that span um, across teams. teams. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's say you're deploying uh, Auth0 across all products. Who's going to take care of making sure that that's taken care of in, in each backlog, reported against, and eventually ticked off? That's some way that they can help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do, just uh, we got it. We got about five five minutes left, Simon. So um, I think you got a slide or two left. Do you want to? Oh no, that's oh, it. So <laughs> yeah, the timing. So so the, I I can, I'm happy to give you the shout out. Like please check out uh, Simon's Product Ops People podcast. Well, a link will go out along with the recording and all that after after this. So yeah, please check it out if you if you're interested in product ops. I think like Simon goes down a bunch of. Um, really specific parts of the product ops role where he's covered a very broad, you know, here's the overview here and why you want to think about it. But if you if you check out the podcast, you can see a lot more detail there. Um, and, and you get 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 more of Simon, which is fantastic. And some of his guests. I think there's a there's a question. So we've we've been through one of the questions. There's another question here. By the way, like if you've got questions, now's the time. We've got a couple of minutes, um, four or five minutes. So 
pop them in the chat or the Q and A window. And I love questions, so please and, bring them forward. Yeah. So we've got we've got a question here from Bill, which is: Have you ever seen a project organization simultaneously run products, particularly cloud? So you're yeah. What do you? A project organization. Um, I, I kind of I'm guessing what you mean there, but um, whether that's a a consultancy, maybe. Um, I think I think. I mean, let's let's, let's take thinking, it back to well, one. I'm just thinking when I hear project, like uh, the the one that I'm thinking there, which is, your one's probably one, and then the other one I'm thinking of is like consultancy or uh, um, a lot of big enterprise, like yeah, that's where I was going to go as well. Really yeah. runs in terms of it, even though on the outside they want to talk product, like when you get into it, it's all project based. Yeah, based. that's where I was going to go as well. Typically, what I'm hearing there, what you see is that's in enterprise product. Um, that's exactly what, what Willow has. We have an enterprise product. Um, we have a, but I'm very clear to keep the project and delivery track um, separate from the product development track. And the more you can separate those, the better. Um, but it's, at the end of the day, you're never going to get away from there, the, the fact that they're linked. And that really comes down to communication. And that's where I think we've excelled in my team in actually establishing uh, rapport, empathy, knowing the other, the other organization, knowing we care about their outcomes as much as their own outcomes and the work that we put into every day to make sure that we're maintaining alignment between any changes or shifts in the product development process and how that can affect our customers and our, our delivery teams and vice versa. Um, that's a constant uh, gardening process for us to make sure that we're all being successful because we know both of them are ultimately uh, super important to have an enterprise product in market that is delivered in an enterprise context. That's super. That's a really, uh, I would, that's a really like interesting answer. Yeah. And I think for me, seeing a lot of like that project thing running in, in practice is like, you can get pockets where there's a bit of product going, but often it's, it's not, it, it's like part of that project based organization is set up from the way budgets work so it's almost a fundamental attribute uh, your example is great simon i think a lot of the enterprise i see trying to do product often has a different funding model that doesn't allow uh like doesn't allow that that to happen like you're, you're hitting the nail on the head though but that comes back to funding and advocacy yeah if the company yeah, if, if the company change. really values product and wants to build a product they need to have product leadership yeah. cpo vp whatever it is and they will have their funding model below them yeah 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 okay. and then so that that's where i see the often you don't see them side by side for that reason because they they're like the funding model so fundamentally needs to needs to change um they, but you know that that being said there's exceptions to that but i mean i guess this comes back to just like i said if you're not going to see great products without great product behaviors and you're not going to see great product behaviors without the space that a executive leadership owning that really represents and, and is accountable for. Yeah. It, and under that, you won't have great product ops unless you have all that already exists. So yeah, they're yeah. going to be limited just like any product manager. But. Any other, uh, so I'm saying they missed some of the audio, there will be a recording. So, you know, you can jump in and, and watch it again. Uh, oh, here we go. Thank you, very subtle. If you confuse project and product, one will poison the other. Yeah, you, yes. <laughs> I'm just going to nod. Is that <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, be clear on, you know, projects are okay. Like, let's not, I, I, I'm of the school of like, projects have their place, like, especially in enterprise land for the reasons we're just touching on. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing an implementation project or something like a project often makes sense, but call it what it is. Yeah. And when you're doing product, call it what it is and, and fund it properly is like my, like, just be clear on what you're doing. Don't blur the like, it's when people blur it and, yes. and then you're going, well, hang on. That's where you, it's same with, I mean, anything with agile when people call me something, we're doing agile, we're really not. And it's like, just don't blur it and be- Scott, clear. Scott, what I hear when you, you talk is call a spade a spade. And it's funny because I've been teaching agile at, at General Assembly for eight plus years now. And yeah. I make it a very, very big point at the beginning of every time I do it is to say, waterfall is waterfall and it does its job, but they're yes. two different tools out of the chest, right? Waterfall is great if you're pouring concrete foundations on a building because you can't change that, right? But software is different. And, and so what I heard from you is use the right tool for the right job. And I completely yeah, agree with just that. Call spade, that's it, call spade a spade. Any other, any other questions? We can, we've probably got another minute, minute or two. And then I think we've all probably got to jump off to something. So 
just la last like pause for any any questions. Uh, while we're waiting, I've I've got one quick one that we'll try and answer, Simon, just in mm -hmm. case we have the last question, which is where does um where do you sit in relation to the development team? Like how, you know, how what's your interaction like with with like the DevOps team and agile coaches? Do you do you overlap? Do you kind of sit side by side? I guess it depends on the uh, the already existing structures and the already existing capabilities. Um, I've I've come from a delivery background, and I, I have the, I'm the firm opinion that it doesn't matter how much research you do, it doesn't matter how much roadmaps you do, if you don't have an excellent delivery function. So if the if delivery function was not working, I would absolutely see it as an opportunity for the product ops people to get involved. But as soon as it is, or the capability is there, there's much more value in your product ops team focusing on uh, product product management research, you know, all of those kind of uh, more abstract disciplines. Um, but at the end of the day, without delivery and nothing happens. So, yeah. um, and I think, I think we've already been through a, a whole wave of agile transformations and all that kind of stuff where you do actually have, and even tooling, which has really helped this, that we do have pretty good delivery compared to how things were before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I would go there if needed, but I, I think there's other you can you either already or you can build strength there relatively easily. Alex, you've asked a um a very big question for not probably not not enough time around. Uh, we're trying to get better with deadlines, but it's very hard. How can we get? I feel like this is an entire webinar. I, I'll send you a message afterwards. That's a big big question. I wish, I wish it was a short short one minute one, but that's a really challenging uh challenging one to ask. Um. Look, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us, Simon, like especially walking us through that, letting get, giving everyone a flavor of product ops. Thank you so much for, for coming on and look for everyone kind of watching now, or if you're watching the YouTube or the replay, uh, please like subscribe to the channel if you, if you love this. Um, we do plenty of videos, plenty of interviews with people like Simon. Um, really loved having you on, Simon. Thank you so much. Have a great time. Thank you. See you, see you next time. Bye. Awesome. Take care. Bye.